morning, everyone. Uh, let me first welcome you all on behalf of Bokar Europe. Uh, my name is Ali Zuppello, and I will co-moderate this webinar with Daniel Marco. Uh, we are two policy researchers at Vocal Europe, and we are honored to moderate this event. We are delighted to have you here today, and we would like to thank you all for accepting our invitation. Uh, please note uh, that this webinar will be recorded and uh, uh, we will disseminate it on our social media channels and via email afterwards. Thank you, Ali. Good morning, everyone. I am Daniel Marco. I'm a policy researcher at Vocal Europe, and I will be assisting Ali, uh, my colleague today, uh, in moderating uh, this webinar. We are pleased to moderate this event and glad to have you here today. Before starting, we would like to give the floor to Mr. Henri, Henri Malos, who is the president of Jean Monnet Association, former president of the European Economic and Social Committee and chairman of Vocal Europe. Thank you. The floor is yours, Mr. Malos. Hello, good morning, everybody. So just a short introduction to say uh, the time our colleagues are joining. I see that some uh, some difficulties to, to join us, but uh, I'm sure they will, they will come in the next uh, minutes to say that uh, so uh, it's uh, I think one of the first uh, webinar that we organize it's organized in, uh, in the European Union in Brussels about this uh, this candidate statute which has been granted to to Ukraine by the European Council 23rd and 24th of, of June and to see which condition I personally I will explain that later but I was uh, already from the beginning and from years ago uh, in favor of the idea that uh, Ukraine should join the European family. There's no reason to exclude countries who are to the east, but of course there are some conditions and we discussed today about the condition. So I'm, I'm very happy in the name of Vokalikov that we, you have accepted this invitation and I say this, uh, this webinar will be recorded and will be put on social media and will be addressed to the European institution. Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you, Mr. Malus. Now let me introduce the topic that will be discussed today. Uh, the European Council conclusions of the 23rd and the 24th of June 2022 granted Ukraine the status of candidate country, hence recognizing the European perspective of Ukraine. This opened the path towards integration. However, as an aspiring member of the EU, Ukraine will have to prove to be able to assume the obligations of membership by satisfying the political and economic conditions enshrined in the Copenhagen criteria. According to the European Commission, Ukraine has made progress uh, on the stability of institutions guaranteeing democracy, the rule of law, human rights and respect for and protection of minorities. However, we still need to assess whether these efforts are sufficient or not. Are these efforts being put at risk by martial law, by the fact that almost all opposition parties have been suspended or banned, and the violations of human rights that are unfortunately reported on both sides by the UN report? In this context, this webinar will focus on the first Copenhagen criteria. Indeed, it is important to consider the future steps that the country has to take in terms of the necessary measures to strengthen the functions of the legislative bodies, implement a solid and effective judicial reform, and finalize the legal framework for national minorities. Moreover, it is important to consider the context in which the application to join the EU was made, namely the involvement of Ukraine in an armed conflict with Russia since the 24th of February 2022. According to the United Nations report on the situation of human rights in Ukraine, the war led to a serious deterioration of the human rights situation across the country. Both civilians and combats have been impacted. The rights of life liberty, security, health, work, education and housing are being violated. In, the, in addition, concerns arose regarding the treatment of prisoners of war, for instance, torture and summary executions, as well as concerns related to the security risks faced by the journalists and media workers in Ukraine. Hence, we will try to address the situation with our speakers today. 
Thank you, Ali, for introducing today's topic. I will now quickly introduce today's panel, and we will then open the debate for our eminent speakers. Um, in the first part of our webinar, our political speakers uh, will have the floor, and our first speaker will be Mr. Elmut Goiking, a German politician who is a member of the European Parliament, representing the Family Party of Germany, and a member of the Committee on Employment and Social Affairs the delegation to the EU-Ukraine Parliamentary Association Committee, as well as the delegation to the Euronest Parliamentary Assembly. Mr. Guking, we are honored to have you here today. I would say... Yes, I warmly welcome everybody and thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, and then die nicht zugestört, würde ich ganz gerne in Deutsch sprechen, damit auch alles vernünftig wird. Und das wird natürlich die Dolmetsch von meinen Mitarbeiterinnen folgen. Also, ich spreche German, aber darf mein Interview mit mir? Ja, wir haben äh, die Beitrittsverhandlungen äh, mit der Ukraine, äh, sind natürlich äh, seit Jahr und Tag schon das Thema und wurden jetzt natürlich äh, mit dem Kandidatenstatus natürlich auf einem ganz anderen Level gehoben. Mm -hmm. The accession negotiations for Ukraine have been going on for a long time, but now, of course, uh, um, they have been risen to another level. Die Frage ist natürlich, ob die Ukraine bereit so weit ist, beizutreten. So the question is whether Ukraine is ready to become a member of the European Union. Also ich kenne die Ukraine sehr gut. Ich war erst im letzten Jahr September noch da zum Feuerwerkfest, äh, große Veranstaltung in Kiew. Mm -hmm. um, I know the Ukraine quite well. I've uh, recently, well, last September, I've been uh, in the Ukraine for a uh, European breakfast, a uh, huge event. And so this uh, was uh, another occasion to uh, see the situation in Ukraine on the spot. Und ich hatte dort in der Eröffnungsrede und in der Öffentlichkeit auch kundgetan, wie meine persönliche Auffassung zum Beitritt der Ukraine zur EU ist. Das war September 2021. At that time, in September 21, so when I was in Kiew, Ukraine, in my opening speech at the prayer breakfast, I um, gave my personal view with regard to Ukraine becoming member and a candidate for the European Union. Und ich hatte damals äh, schon ausgeführt, dass äh, 2019, als Zelensky gewählt worden ist, habe ich in einem Fernsehinterview kurz getan, dass Zelensky liefern muss, dieses Wahlergebnis verpflichtet, Zelensky mm -hmm. muss liefern. Mm -hmm. Um, at that time, say 2019, when Zelensky came into office, I um, on TV stated that uh, the election would uh, lead to certain obligations and that Zelensky would be obliged to deliver to expectations. Ich hatte im letzten Jahr bei der Veranstaltung gesagt, ich kann nicht erkennen, dass Zelensky geliefert hat. And uh, at the same meeting, I said that uh, I couldn't see at that point in time that uh, Zelensky was delivering. I didn't see this. Also die Ukraine ist von Rechtsstaatlichkeit, von uh, Pressefreiheit uh, ganz, ganz stark entfernt. The Ukraine is far away from rule of law and uh, freedom of press. Yeah. Uh, Und äh, die Ukraine hat noch einen langen, langen Weg vor sich. Ukraine has a long way to go to get there. Und äh, zunehmend trafen damals äh, Informationen von NGOs an, die eben entsprechend die Misshandlung und Verfolgung von Journalisten anprangerten und auch Beweise vorlegten. Mm -hmm. At that time, NGOs, so non-governmental organizations, also made public uh, uh, persecutions uh, and uh, of journalists uh, and press representatives, uh, and they uh, showed evidence uh, of these persecutions. Und da spiegelt sich das System, das bestehende System der Oligarchen nämlich wieder, die keine Presse, eine freie Presse haben. Mm -hmm. So this shows uh, that uh, there is still this oligarch system that is not, and the representative, the representatives of which are not interested in freedom of press or other. 
auch zu den anderen Kriterien von Kopenhagen, wie zum Beispiel die wirtschaftliche Stabilität, sich in der Ukraine nicht gegeben. Mm -hmm. Other Copenhagen criteria like economic stability is not a given factor either. Hinzu kommt, dass die Ukraine, das ist Ihnen allen bekannt, zu den korruptesten Staaten dieser Erde gehört. Um, moreover, and everybody is aware and informed, Ukraine is one of the most corrupt states well, worldwide. Das spiegelt sie sich jetzt jüngst wieder von den Pandora-Papieren. We have seen this as well with the Pandora Papers. Wo 41 Millionen äh, US-Dollar gefunden worden sind, die 38 Abgeordnete und dann auch zu den Krieg gehören. Uh -huh. 41 Millionen US-Dollar um, uh, in Pandora Papers have uh, been shown to be uh, possessed by uh, Uh, members of Parliament uh, and Zelensky, so 38 members of Parliament and Zelensky were earning these 41 million worth of Pandora papers. in September 21 in Kiev sagte. Und heute muss ich Ihnen sagen, der Krieg hat an diesen grundsätzlichen Bedingungen eigentlich nicht geändert. Mm -hmm. Well, these were the basic conditions, or these was the basic situation in September 21 when I was in Kiev. And the war actually didn't change anything to this. It's the same as before. There are changes given to the war, for sure, I'm well aware, but... Und insofern ist natürlich das Zweifelsabkommen schon, also die Beitrittskandidaten, Uh, still schon and uh, well, um, things are to develop, and uh, uh, so as to develop things, uh, the accession status, uh, 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 being an official candidate um, to join European Union, will help hopefully. Aber dazu möchte ich sagen, es besteht kein Automatismus, auch wirklich der EU beizutreten. But uh, there shouldn't, uh, it, it shouldn't be just automatically that uh, Ukraine joins in. I mean, there has to be evidence of change and improvement, uh, and it cannot just happen just like that. As Beispiel möchte ich hier die Türkei anführen. Wie lange sind wir schon der Türkei als mm -hmm. If we have it, uh, look at uh, Turkey. How long is it that we are negotiating with Turkey about accession to European Union? Jetzt gilt es erst einmal, dass wir die Ukraine schnellstens befrieden. Now, the most important is to make sure peace is coming back to Ukraine. Und dass wir dann die Ukraine ein Grundgerüst der Demokratie mitgeben. And then a basic uh, democratic system is to be established in Ukraine. Mit Steuerreform, Justizreform, Wirtschaftsreform. With uh, reforms. Uh, um, in the fields of tax, justice and uh, economy. Um die Ukraine fit zu machen für unser Europa. To prepare Ukraine to participate in our Europe. Aber das ist noch ein langer, langer Weg. But I do think there's a long road to, to go. Also so sehe ich es zumindest und äh, ja, und so sehen es auch viele meiner Kolleginnen und Kollegen hier im Europäischen Rat. This is at least my point of view, and many of my colleagues here in the European Parliament think the same. Und was man nicht verwechseln darf, was immer die Menschen verwechseln grundsätzlich, das hatte ich auch in der Ukraine bereits ausgeführt, aber nicht nur da, auch mehrfach schon öffentlich, ein EU-Beitritt ist nicht gleichzusetzen mit einem NATO-Beitritt. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing that must be kept in mind as well, and I already said it uh, back then in um, September 2021, being a member of European Union does not mean that you become a member of NATO. These are two different things. Und ich möchte auch nicht verschweigen, dass wo ich im September 21 da war, auch da schon der Krieg tobte in Donetsk und Johan. Mm -hmm. And we mustn't forget uh, um, Donetsk and um, Luk uh, Donetsk und Luka. Luans. Luans. Um, there was a war already in the, those regions. The war was uh, already um, present in September 2021. Nicht in der Dimension, wie er heute ist, durch den, durch den Überfall von Russland. 
the war was not uh, didn't take the same dimension as today, but uh, in those two regions, war was going on. Aber war mit russischem Material natürlich schon geführt. And um, it, Russians delivered uh, the material and equipment for this war in those two regions. Yeah, this is just what I can say. Well, this is my contribution so far. Only as to the tiefer to gain. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peking. Thank you, Mr. Gooking, for sharing your opinion, and thanks to the interpreter for collaborating as well. Uh, our second speaker today was supposed to be Mrs. Micaela Del Monte, but unfortunately she had to withdraw at last moment. Um, she will be replaced by uh, our chairman at Vocal Europe, Mr. Um, Henri Malos, as former president of the European and Economic uh, Social Committee uh, during the maiden period. We are also glad to have online Mr. Um, Humbert de Biolay, uh, who is the deputy head of the liaison office of the Council of Europe in Brussels, who may intervene during the debate. Uh, Mr. de Biolay, we are glad to have you here today. Um, and then our last speaker for the first part today was supposed to be Mrs. Anna Danelia uh, Arex, but unfortunately she won't be able to make it because she got COVID. Um, hence, she will be replaced by uh, Mr. Uh, Bertrand Malmondier, who is an expert in European constitutional and administrative law, partner in a German French law firm based in Berlin. Uh, glad to have you here, Mr. Uh, Malmondier. The second part of our webinar will be dedicated to the journalists and civil society's opinions. And our first speaker in this second part will be uh, Mr. Guy Metton, um, a journalist at Tribune de Genève, a Swiss uh, French language regional um, daily newspaper, and Die Weltwoche, a Swiss uh, weekly magazine based in Zurich. Um, welcome to our webinar, Mr. Metton. Um, our second uh, speaker today in the second part is uh, Mr. Mikolas Krivansky, uh, Brussels-based EU journalist and expert uh, on minorities' rights. Thank you for being with us today, Mr. Krivansky. Um, then we have uh, Mrs. Uh, Camille Suriz uh, Gesson, who is a deputy editor in chief at uh, Agence uh, Europe. Uh, dear Mrs. Uh, Gesson, we are pleased to have you here today. Um, and finally, we will have Mrs. Uh, Joanne Delaney, who is a funding member of the Community House uh, of Europe, an association dedicated to EU uh, citizens' rights. Uh, Mrs. Delaney, we are glad to have you here today. With a panel this broad and experienced, we are confident that the debate that follows will be exciting and revealing. Uh, please note that the speakers of the first part of the webinar will have the floor for five minutes. Um, and then in the second part of our discussion, our speakers will take the floor for also five minutes uh, before we move to the, the Q&A session, uh, the last part of uh, our webinar. During the Q&A session, if you desire to ask questions or add a comment, um, thanks for identifying yourself by clicking on the raise uh, your hand option that you can find in the bottom menu, and we will be able to give you uh, the floor. Okay. Well, um, okay. Then uh, uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, now we will start with the first part of this uh, webinar. Would you like to ask the first question? And I'm going. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, the first question we have will be addressed to uh, Mr. Uh, Malos. Um, considering the ongoing war on Ukrainian territory and the violations reported in the United Nations report, uh, how would you evaluate the situation in Ukraine concerning human rights and the rule of law? Uh, Mr. Maloth, the floor, the floor is yours. Uh, <clears throat> yes, thank you very much. I would, I would just speak because uh, uh, the other colleague of the of, of, uh, European Parliament, our administration was not there, but we have a chance to have Mr. Goking here as a member of the European Parliament and the uh, Ukraine delegation was very clear. I would just add one point concerning civil society, because it's my point. I was president of the European Institute, European Economic and Social Committee, 
during the during the Maidan event, and I was uh, the unique president of the institution to be present on Maidan, and I deserve that to have been banned by, by Russia among the 89. European personality to have been banned. But nevertheless, I worked with Ukraine since, uh, I think, the Orange Revolution. We established contact and civil society based. And uh, of course, I, I would say that myself, during Maidan and now, it was always very difficult to establish contact with civil society organization in, uh, in, uh, in Ukraine, particularly science, uh, science uh, since, uh, since Maidan. The main reason is that there is a coexistence of traditional uh, social economic partners, trade unions, employees, federation, and others. And then there is the new civil society movement from minor. And this comes to opposition, even to clash. We had in the European Economic and Social Committee to wait for years before it was possible to establish a parity committee. So I think, and I will be very brief, as I said, there is really the need uh, to uh, and I think the uh, Council of Europe, European, Commun European Parliament should really help European Economic Social Committee and NGOs should really help uh, the, the Ukrainians to understand the, our way to work, to understand also the necessity of giving democratic space for, for everybody. Even if an organization exists in the past, I give an example of trade unions, uh, not for trade unions movement, but I give that examples. You cannot consider that the new ones are the good ones and the old ones are the bad ones and, uh, and, and ban the, the, the old ones to exist. You should find the criteria and find democratic way to organize. And this is, uh, this is the situation that we face today. I think there is a lack of understanding uh, still of all democratic rules. And this is the work that we have to do. Thank you very much. And I think we have, uh, after me, uh, some... Uh, case would be presented by, by Mr. Malmandier, who shows that uh, uh, all the margin of improvement that still exists to make this uh, enlargement to Ukraine success. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mullis. Uh, now I will ask uh, a question to Mr. Malmandier. Um, Considering the ongoing war on Ukraine territory and the violations uh, reported in uh, the United Nations report, how would you evaluate the situation in Ukraine concerning human rights and the rule of law? Mr. Malmondier, the floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, good morning, and thank you very much, uh, dear Mr. Chairman, and also to the team of Vocal Europe for your kind invitation and introduction. Um, my focus of the short speech will on, indeed be on the judiciary. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as a candidate country um, for EU membership, um, Ukraine must, despite the Russian invasion, in my opinion, develop a, a strong self-understanding that the protection of human rights and fundamental procedural rights must be a national concern of its own, and that the rule of law uh, is not a means of political conflict, but an important pillar for the development of a healthy civil society. Respecting and preserving the rule of law must become an end in itself. You mentioned it on, indeed on the 5th of July um, 2022, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights presented an interim report on the situation of human rights in Ukraine. Um, the report involves various violations of human rights, including the rule of law issues. The report highlights that the security service of Ukraine, called SBU, and the national police have reportedly arrested over 1,000 individuals suspected, suspected of supporting Russian armed forces. The commissioner expressed the concerns that arrests may have not been carried out in line with Ukraine's international human rights obligations. While the commissioner does not go into detail since the report is only interim, I can make some illustrations for you um, from real life uh, cases in Ukraine. What, what endangers the rule of law in Ukraine um, are, first of all, arbit arbitrary detentions from the SPU, coupled with corruption in the Ukrainian courts and lacking judicial independence, which has always, always been a topic of the criticism from international partners such as the European Union. Unfortunately, unfortunately it is a standard practice in Ukraine to fight political disputes with the means of the law and thus eliminate political opponents. We feel that 
uh, this situation has deteriorated uh, with the outbreak of uh, the war in February 2022. And Mr. Goiking correctly pointed out that a critical state of things existed already before the war and since um, President Zelensky's introduction to, to power. A prominent example um, that we are unfortunately still far away from the rule of law in Ukraine is the case of Mr. Viktor Medvedchuk. This case, unfortunately, is a reminiscent of the Moscow show trials of 1937. Mr. Medvedchuk has a long political past in Ukraine and is still today a deputy of the Rada. Along with former President Petro Poroshenko, Mr. Medvedchuk is Ukraine's main opposition leader today. Unfortunately, we do strongly feel that the war is used as a pretext to eliminate the political opposition in Ukraine and not only the Russian-friendly opposition. Ladies and gentlemen, in 2014-2015, Mr. Medvedchuk was asked by German Chancellor Angela Merkel to mediate on various acute issues between Ukraine, the separatistic areas, and Russia, including the resumption of coal supplies from the Donbas, which are vital for Ukraine. Today, in having done this, he and President, uh, former President Poroshenko are accused by the Ukrainian judiciary of having financed terrorist organizations. Please let me give you some examples of violations of the rule of law and fundamental procedural rights in the case of Mr. Medvedchuk. After his arrest in April 2022, Mr. Medvedchuk was apparently ill-treated and tortured. Since his arrest, he lost a lot of weight in detention. His assets and property are being socialized or redistributed. His political party, the Opposition Platform for Life, has been banned, all assets seized. High officials in Ukraine called for confessions to be eaten out of him. Despite being a Ukrainian citizen, President Zelensky offered Mr. Bindvichuk to the Russians in exchange for Ukrainian prisoners of war and foreign mercenaries. Mr. Medvedchuk is not in a regular pre-trial detention center, but, but is being held at a secret location of the security services. The law firm which represents him before international organizations and the European Court of Human Rights has been denied all access to him since April 2022. The Ukrainian defense team is only sporadically granted access to Mr. Medvedchuk, and when they do get this access, the meetings are not confidential and representatives of the Secret Service are always present. The defense team is not present at important stages of the investigation, especially when fundamental confessions are made. The lawyers learn about these confessions only from the media. Appeals and legal remedies are submitted by the judiciary to the Secret Service SBU for decision making. In general, it's quite incompatible with our understanding of the separa separation of powers and the fact that a secret service plays such an important role in an investigation is strange for our understanding of law. Imagine that in the US, the CIA, or in Germany, the Bundesnachrichtendienst would be an investigative body. We are not familiar with this. Although Mr. Medvedchuk resides in Kiev, the trial against him is held in Lviv, which has no jurisdiction. The judge who declared himself competent has already attracted attention in the past for his harsh treatment of critics of the regime. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your kind attention um, and that I had the opportunity to present these thoughts to you and to resume as a member of the European family. Ukraine must learn, even in the difficult times of war, that respecting the law, protect, protecting opposition, political opposition, and being a role model for other candidate countries is an end in itself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Malmandier, for your uh, elaboration. Uh, now we will move on to the second part of this webinar. Uh, so we invite uh, <clears throat> Mr. Meton, Mr. Krivansky, Ms. Jusson, and uh, Ms. Delany, Delany to react to what has been said previously. Uh, so please feel free to share your opinion. Um, we would like to, if Mr. Metan would like to start in sharing his thoughts, uh, please, we will leave you the floor. Oops. Okay. Oh. Ah. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to 
to to to react to this and to comment this uh, uh, this first uh, impressions about the remarks, the opening remarks of our our forum. I, I am a journalist. I am living in in Switzerland, so I am not. We are not member of the EU, and I can only speak as an observer, as a, as a distant, or not so distant, <laughs> close observer of the situation in uh, in Europe uh, uh, presently. Uh, for me, I have I have maybe a few remarks to 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 say to tell. The first one, I mean, uh, the technical uh, conditions. For the um, for the um, for Ukraine to be to become a member of the EU, uh, technical technical issues are not the main problem, because as you know, uh, these issues are related to corruption, to the independence of justice, uh, uh, to governance, uh, free market, uh, free market, human rights, and so on. As we have. Uh, discussed as we have talked uh, uh, just now. Uh, it's clear for me that Ukraine has, uh, is very far to fulfill the, these conditions now uh, because it, it has been exposed in never, in never, in, in no field uh, Ukraine is able to become a member not in the human rights case, uh, not in uh, the independence of ju justice, uh, the case of corruption, it's uh, obvious. And uh, so, but uh, for me, it's not, even if it is, if it will be very hard uh, to fulfill these conditions, it could be possi possible because it's uh, political conditions. So, if uh, Ukraine is taking some measures or some facade measures to fulfill these uh, conditions, I think uh, European unions, because of political reasons, will ac probably accept Ukraine as a member. Because how to exactly uh, measure uh, the degree of corruption, of independence of justice, it's a political question more than um, you know, a real, a real based, uh, um, uh, yes, uh, conditions. So that's not the main problem for me, even if it, it will be very hard for Ukraine to reach and to fulfill these conditions. The, the, the main problem for me is security and defense, as we have seen, not only because of the war, war is effectively very important. But if you look the history of European Union, you can see there is a deep relation between NATO membership and European Union membership. Uh, the main, all the U Eastern European countries have uh, been member of NATO before to uh, become a member of the European Union. If it is like as if the uh, membership membership to NATO is a precondition to become a member of the European Union, it's not the case of Finland and Sweden and Austria because they are neutral country, but they were so uh, they were so integrated already in the European world that it's not really a problem, and they are neutral, which is not the case of uh, Ukraine, which is not uh, a neutral country. So uh, this problem, and it, uh, if uh, Ukraine will be, will uh, has to become a member of the European Union, at least it has to be able to become a member of NATO at first, or uh, at least to become neutral. And uh, for the moment, we have nothing heard from Kiev uh, to become a, non a neutral state. You know, to 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 uh, like Switzerland, Austria, or Finland, or, or Sweden. So that's for me a, a, a bigger difficulty uh, than uh, the other ones I mentioned, like corruption, human rights, and so on. Why? Because uh, this uh, 
this uh, NATO and security problem for me is the main issue uh, in Europe, not only actually, not only presently, but in the past too. NATO was founded before the AU uh, in 1949, uh, AU in 1957. So it's AU is looking like a follow up of NATO membership and uh, a precon yes, as I explained, a precondition to become a member because I think it was the post Second World War um, effect consequences. And uh, it's also uh, the uh, come on, uh, for the yes, uh, it's a condition imposed by the United States, uh, which is the real the real power inside the NATO. Uh, it's United States who are deciding what are the conditions of security and defense and so on in, in Europe. So that's the the for me a problem. Second, second remark or third remark, it's about history. I uh, published a book uh, called The Lost Continent. It was the destiny of the Europe. In this book, I make some comparison with the uh, former Greek, Greece, Greek history, uh, how the leagues, you know, how the unions have tried, uh, have, su have been successful or not successful in the history. And I also studied the, the former uh, attempts of European unions in the history. Since Charlemagne, Charles de Carl de Grosse, um, uh, un until to Napoleon, until to Austrian uh, Roman, Roman, uh, um, German Roman Holy Empire, uh, Austrian Empire, uh, yes, Napoleon attempt, uh, Stalin attempt, Hitler attempts, and I studied why they collapsed or why they were successful or pretty successful or not successful. And I think if Ukraine is becoming a member of the European Union, it will be the breaking point of European Union because the tensions are so high with another country uh, another European Union uh, country, which is Russia. Uh, so, and the contradictions between both will be so high that it will be for the European Union a case of, let's say, collapse or uh, um, failure. Uh, because uh, these tensions, all the, 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 the former uh, Union attempts have collapsed because of internal tensions. Uh, I, I mean, internal tensions to the continent, for instance, in the former Greece or uh, in the former European uh, history. So it will be impossible to overcome uh, these uh, tensions. And the war is the symptom, the actual war is the symptom of these tensions. They will not disappear even if the war ceased. That's why I am not so optimistic. I'm not sure it's a solution now uh, for Ukraine to become a member because it's probably too early. Uh, before uh, to have Ukraine as a member, we have to make a peace or kind of partnership. I don't know how to call it with Russia. Otherwise, the tensions will be too high and it will be, uh, for me, impossible for the European Union to maintain its, dyn its dynamics uh, with uh, Ukraine uh, membership. So take just a few remarks, uh, a few comments about our team today. Thank you, Mr. Metan, uh, for expressing your opinions. Uh, Mr. Goking, we see you would like to react but we kindly ask you to uh, be patient a little bit and we will give you the floor after the current speakers and before the questions. Uh, we will now move to um, uh, Mr. Krivansky. Uh, Mr. Krivansky, we would like to have your opinion and tell us uh, what are your thoughts about uh, what has been evoked uh, previously concerning the situation uh, um, of human rights and the rule of law in uh, Ukraine. 
Um, the floor is yours, Mr. Kiewanski. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, at first, uh, I would like uh, thanks to, for the invitation. Uh, there is a, a very important question concerning Ukraine and the minority issues. Can we consider the Russian-speaking community of Ukraine to be a minority? Because uh, when we are talking of minorities, uh, it's even even the the word uh, means that it's a smaller group of of persons. In the case of the main group. Uh, in Ukraine is the Russian-speaking group because uh, alongside this, uh, this group there are a lot of other uh, language and national communities in, in Ukraine but uh, the, the focus on, on the minority issue and the, on the human rights questions um, in this case uh, in, is the Russian community. What will be the consideration of the European Union concerning this, this community. We can see in the Baltic states that the Russian communities are uh, not tolerated uh, sufficiently from the uh, European uh, point of view of human rights, because you, you have second uh, zone, uh, sec second zone uh, citizens in the Baltic states. You have Russians, they are tolerated, but they have no uh, uh, nationality of, of, of the country where they are living. So, how it will be in Ukraine? What, what are the criteria? What, what uh, uh, union, uh, the European Union is expected from, uh, from Ukraine? Because if we are looking back to the last 20, 25 years uh, with the enlargement process, we had the, the experience that the Union uh, focused on the minority, but the criteria was not uh, uh, precisely determined. So until now, we are in a situation concerning the, the European minorities in the Union, there is no common uh, 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 criteria accepted by all member states. Let's say, if you take Greece, they do not recognize the, the existence of minorities in Greece. This is one side. Even France uh, doesn't uh, um, recognize the existence of minorities. From the other hand, you have states that are very large in, in the approach concerning the minorities, and, and uh, we have, there is lack of a common minority uh, minima. So, in my opinion, there, the first thing to do, the union has to take a decision and uh, uh, precisely, definitely uh, make a statement what they are uh, uh, considering, what the minority rights are, and how the states should uh, uh, exert it, and how can it be controlled by, by, the, by the union. Because until now, if we are looking, uh, these questions are uh, uh, state member competencies. So, you have, of course, you have the, 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 the card of human rights or the, the, and so on, but this is not, not uh, a solution. So, in the Ukrainian case, uh, we have to uh, uh, determine uh, precisely what we are asking from the Ukrainians and what they are able to guarantee for their uh, citizens. Not enough uh, uh, just to change uh, those uh, conditions which are uh, ruling now the minority uh, rights. As you know, uh, after the Maidan, the first step was to ban Russian language from uh, from the public life, uh, and it is one of the main uh, main problem. Uh, uh, it is not, of course, it is not the cause of the war, but it's a one main problem to be resolved. From the other uh, side, we have it will be a minority considered as a minority or a 
a co-national component of the, of the Ukrainian nation, in, on, not on ethnic basis, but on civic basis. So this is my my uh, my uh, remarks concerning the the, the the main questions to be to be resolved and to be answered. Thank you for attention. After if you if there are other questions, I will uh, uh, approfond my my answers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Krivansky, for your elaboration. Uh, now we would like to have uh, Ms. Gestan's opinion on what has been discussed so far. So please, the floor is yours. Hi, hey, you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes my connection is not really good. That's why I didn't put my camera on till now. Um, thank you for the invitation. I will not be able to stay too long because it's a big enlargement day, not for Ukraine, but for North Macedonia and Albania. And I have to cover it, so I'm really sorry. Uh, so I will try to be quick in my introduction. So I will have more time to answer some questions in the 10 minutes I will have or five minutes I will have. So uh, as I'm working at Agence Europe, I'm following from the institutional point of view, the enlargement process. So the road to the EU uh, has just begun for Ukraine. We have to be clear with that. The road will be really, really long. It could take 10, 15, 20 years, we will see. And maybe it will stop before the end. We have also to, to think about that. We have seen that with uh, Turkey, for example. Now it's totally frozen and we don't know what will happen next. So uh, if the European Council has granted the candidate status to Ukraine at the end of June, the country will have to make a lot of progress because before we will be able to open its negotiations. It's quite technical, but it means before really moving into the process, we will have to do a lot of, uh, of reforms. It's a really political sign to give the candidate status to Ukraine. But the country knows and the Commission knows um, there is a lot of progress who will be need to be done before moving ahead. So uh, the commission in our report is really, really clear. So there is um, seven areas in which the Ukraine needs to do some progress. So quickly, I will try to explain these uh, seven areas. First, it's in the judici judiciary sorry, uh, sector uh, with a lot of uh, implementation linked to uh, um, judges. So selection of judges, vetting of judges, and so on in different courts. So there is a lot of work to do in judiciary. It's not new for years, and the commission is asking for progress in, uh, in this uh, sector, and it's still, uh, it's still not done. Then the big, big, big issue from my point of view, it's fight against corruption. And it's the same for years, the European Commission and the European Council are asking for moves from Ukraine to fight against corruption. There is corruption everywhere in uh, Ukraine. It could be when you go to see your doctor, but it could be also at the high level um, of the politicians. Zelensky knows that. I don't know if you have seen his, uh, his sitcoms when he was still an actor, and there is an episode on it really clear that he wants to do some works in the country and everybody wants to take his part of the money from the state. So it's something everybody knows in Ukraine, but there is still a lot of work to be done. Uh, they try to do a special court for um, anti-corruption, a special prosecutor office, and then we still have to wait for nomination on it, for a new ad, because the ad was not a good one and so on. So it's a really long process about that. There is also a need to ensure that the anti-money laundering legislation is in compliance with international standards. The anti-oligarch law also, it's important because it's a big issue also in Ukraine, the Oligarchs are controlling a lot of things, and it's the same for the other country of the region. We have the same for Moldova, we have the same for Georgia. They have to move on that to uh, limit the influence of oligarchs in economy, in political, and in public life. They are also to uh, make progress in the media uh, law. There is a big trouble with media in Ukraine. Uh, I have met a few days ago people from Radio Free Europe, and they are really, really concerned about the freedom of press. In Ukraine, they say the Commission has to take care of that, to look at that before the country will be part of the EU. So we have plenty of time, but really something that concerns a lot of people who know uh, Ukraine. And uh, then, as uh, my former, uh, the former people said, uh, they have to to finalize the reform of uh, of the legal framework for minority uh, national minorities. It was a big issue between Ukraine and uh, Hungary. Hungary blocked a lot of. Uh, meetings between uh, countries with Hungary, like in NATO, or even in the EU uh, with uh, Ukraine because of that. And uh, the European Commission knows that. 
Uh, while recommending the granting of the status to Ukraine, the president of the European Commission said that um, Ukraine has a vital parliamentary presidential democracy and a functioning administration. So we will see if the administration will be still able to work during the war. Until now, it's quite okay. But I mean, if we can tell that like that, Kiev is still working. People are still working in Kiev, but we don't know what will happen with the war. So we have to be careful with that. And also the Deputy Prime Minister of European and Euro-Atlantic Integration, Olga Stefanishina, sorry for her name, I stressed last week with a meeting uh, with the, uh, a colleague from the Czech Republic that the priority would be the reconstruction and the recovery of the country. And the negotiations are important, but it will be not at the top priority. They have to, uh, to reconstruct the country, to rebuild the country before uh, winter time, to, be, to have people who are able to be in real house with the heater for winter time and for them it's a real priority so we'll see how is it will be able to move also on the criteria how is it will be to able to move on reforms uh, right now then they will first of all and i think everybody understand why they will have to rebuild the country first thank you thank you mrs jason for sharing your opinion uh, mrs delaney we invite you now to tell us your opinion and share your comments about what was said uh, previously uh, the floor is yours mrs delaney thank you yes good morning can you hear me yes okay yes. um well the subject is the accession of ukraine and um i think we have to go beyond the subject. I think it's actual, real technical accession is a long way off. And I couldn't agree more with Mr. Meton. We have a huge security issue and we have quite a big Russia problem. And until we end the war to start with and we find some arrangement with Russia, I think we are going to have an ongoing um, conflict uh, in the area. Now, despite my respect for our heads of state and for the heads of NATO, um, who must have complete information and are solidly united in their decisions, I'm wondering why we are now in, a gen in, in an agenda that seems to take the ongoing conflict as a, as a given. Okay, it's normal that uh, precautions would be taken to find alternative energy supplies, but um, we don't necessarily hear very much anymore about trying to end this conflict. And nobody is daring to even organize conferences on it or organize uh, a new series of conferences on our Russia policy. I know it's all terribly sensitive and probably very difficult but um i'm wondering why the emphasis has yes of course the war was a little bit of a shock we all expected it but we hoped it would never happen and that it would happen in 50 years time and not in february 2022 but i think we need to think as mr metten said we need to think very seriously about how we reorganize our relations with Russia and we need to end the war. Um, I think, unfortunately, it will mean the Ukrainians will be neutral, which they don't like. But I think Mr. Zelensky, going back a couple of months, put it out that they would be prepared not to be members of NATO. Um, and uh, then I think there won't be any political um, facade membership because of this ongoing uh, deep uh, security issue. And um, it's, I don't mean to discourage uh, the Ukrainians. It also seems that inside Ukraine, even without the war, um, things were far from perfect. And they needed to do quite a bit of work to actually to meet the, the, the criteria or even come close on a number of, of the conditions that would, that would be involved. 
I suppose, I suppose in a way, giving them recognition of, of a membership uh, application maybe helps them psychologically. It means that they won't be abandoned, they won't be let down. But I hope that they really realize that they are sitting in the heartland of Russia, that this has always been an issue and more so as we have somehow neglected our relations with Russia and that they, they, there's a double uh, agenda that needs to be seriously, seriously addressed. It will take some time. How to roll things back from an armed conflict when we all wish it could have been avoided. I think that is where we're at, even if membership um, status probably does help psychologically. But it, I don't think it will be done for political reasons. Um, I don't think that is on the cards at all. I'm sorry to be so pessimistic, not pessimistic, but to try and be realistic about the situation. I also think it's essential that this war is limited. That's why I say it's important to end it. Um, there are parties outside of the conflict in the rest of the world who are supporting one or other party and then changing their minds and then becoming more involved in, um, shall we say, uh, accessory issues and thinking that they may be able to get for, forward on, on other agendas. It's just, um, it's not helping uh, beyond the, the geographical limitations. And I really think it's important to limit it to it uh, to focus on it, to end it, uh, to prevent more more movement uh, throughout other unstable zones. And thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Zeleny, for your uh, elaboration. Before we move to the um, uh, Q&A session, we would like to give the floor to Mr. Guking, since he has raised his hand before. So please, uh, Mr. Guking, the floor is yours. Yeah, vielen Dank. Ja, alles, was wir bisher gehört haben, ist alles richtig. Nur auch ganz klar. Uh, All that has been said is right. There's no question about this. Also, wenn wir beiden sprechen, the minority protection of uh, Russian-speaking people in Eastern European countries is not in existence so far. Da haben wir natürlich erheblichen Handlungsbedarf, nicht nur in der Ukraine, sondern auch in anderen Ländern. We will have to act on this, not only in Ukraine, but as well in other Eastern countries. Es ist mit Europa nicht vereinbar, wie Litauen und Lettland sich zum Beispiel auch gegenüber der russischen Bevölkerung verhält, in denen russisch verboten wird oder die die extra Pässe bekommen. Das ist Stigmatisierung und das ist nicht mit europäischen Grundwerten in Einklang zu bringen. Und da müssen wir handeln. It is not uh, compatible with the European values, what happens as well in countries like uh, Lithuania um, or, um, um, or others, uh, that uh, Russian people get uh, extra passports uh, or that their language is forbidden. This is not uh, compatible with the European values. Und wir alle haben auf diesen Sektor viel zu lange zugeschaut. But we all let things go for too long a time with regard to Russian minorities in Eastern Europe. Und als, die, als Russland seine Truppen an der ukrainischen Grenze zusammengezogen hat, and when Russia gathered its troops at the Ukrainian border, bin ich mit meiner Mitarbeiterin nach Armenien geflogen zu einer Konferenz, I went to Armenia to a conference und hatte einen Friedensplan, um den Krieg zu verhindern, mit 20 Punkte Friedensplan im Gepäck gehabt. And I presented actually a 20 point, uh, a peace plan comprising, comprising 20 points. In meinem Büro gemeinsam mit dem Büro des russischen Botschafters hier in Brüssel gearbeitet hatte. Mm -hmm. 
um, my office uh, and uh, the representative of the Russian embassy here in Brussels uh, have been working on this peace plan uh, comprising 20 points uh, and that then um, uh, was presented in Armenia. Und dann hatte ich in Armenien den armenischen, russischen Botschafter, also russische Botschafter von Armenien übergeben, in der Hoffnung, so wie der russische Botschafter von Brüssel, dass er näher an der Ost dran ist. So, I introduced this plan, or I handed over this plan to the Russian ambassador in Armenia, hoping that, well, like here, the ambassador of the Russian, uh, the Russian ambassador, that the um, Russian ambassador of Armenia would be closer to Lavrov. And this Friedensplan, den we dort eingereicht haben, hat eigentlich, uh, also an diesem Friedensplan selbst, hat sich eigentlich nichts geändert, und er wäre nach wie vor noch machbar und umsetzbar. Mm -hmm. And this peace plan that uh, I handed over in Armenia at that time would still be peace feasible. Nothing would have to, nothing major would have to be changed. Und ich mach's kurz, dann beinhaltet genau das, was gerade angesprochen worden ist. And I will be brief, because uh, this peace plan contains precisely what has just been uh, spoken about. Ja, einmal von Mr. Metan. Um, um, it was Metan Mr. Metana, Metan said. Ja, das NATO, und da dreht sich alles drauf. Wir müssen die NATO reformieren it's und von ihnen heraus erneuern. It's all about NATO. NATO needs to be reformed. Wir müssen dazu übergehen, dass wenn jemand einen Antrag stellt, in die NATO aufgenommen zu werden, dass die Nachbarländer Vetorecht haben. If somebody wants NATO membership, sir, the neighboring countries have a word, must have a word to say. They must have a right to veto with regard to any claim to become NATO member. Und dann schlugen wir vor, dass wir dann gesagt haben, okay, dann gibt es zwei Arten von NATO-Mitgliedschaft, einmal die Schutzmitgliedschaft und einmal die Vollmitgliedschaft. Mm -hmm. And then we suggest in our peace plan that uh, there are two kind of NATO memberships uh, to come. Um, one a protection, kind of protective membership, and the other one a full membership. Wenn uh, NATO eingelegt wird, gibt es nur eine Schutzmitgliedschaft. If a neighboring country would uh, um, use its veto right, then only a protection membership would be possible within NATO. Und das würde im Umkehrschluss bedeuten, dass in diesem Land keine Truppen stationiert werden dürfen, keine Raketen stationiert werden dürfen, keine NATO-Geräte stationiert werden dürfen. Aber dieses Land im vollen Schutz eines Nicht-Angriffspaktes erhält. Mm -hmm. So this would mean that in the country concerned, no NATO troops could be stationed, no missiles, no NATO equipment. But on the other hand, full protection would be given to this country. With this instrument, the Schutzmitgliedschaft, would the NATO the fear and the fear of other countries, the agenda only as fear, like for example, Russland, other countries eindämmen. Mm -hmm. uh, with this kind of protection memberships, uh, other countries would no longer uh, need to be afraid, like Russia. We have raketen stationed in Romania, we have raketen stationed in Poland, we have the troops from the NATO who have been on the border of Russland, uh, well before Russland in Ukraine came. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have, that was for Russland a threat, to say that Ukraine is NATO member. Georgien mit NATO-Mitglied. Das ist für Russland natürlich eine Bedrohung, solange wir dieses alte System der NATO so unreformiert haben. Um, so, um, we have missiles in Romania, in Poland. We have uh, had all our troops on the Russian border far before Russia went into Ukraine. Of course, this was considered by Russia to be a threat. Um, to talk about Ukraine, NATO membership, uh, Georgia's uh, NATO membership, all this is a threat to a country like Russia, of course. Und das Ganze muss man betrachten, das Ganze muss man einen Kontext sehen. And this all has to be taken together. It's uh, the whole overall context has to be taken into consideration. And I agree with Mr. Delany. 
also be too short. I absolutely agree and I highly agree with Mrs. Delany. But she said that we end the Schwerpunkt aufsetzen müssen, Frieden zu schaffen. We first of all have to make sure peace is re-established. And I say to you, I am very upset when I hear the discussion in the European Parliament. And I'm very upset given the current discussions in the European Parliament. Es geht nur darum, die Spirale der Gewalt weiter zu drehen. It's only about more violence, ever more violence and nothing else. Härtere Waffen, mehr Waffen. More weapons, uh, uh, better Waffen. weapons, uh, stronger weapons. Das sind das, was gefordert wird, aber wie Frau Delany richtig angefangen hat, keine Friedenskonferenzen. All this is what people ask for, but not like Mrs. Delany rightly claimed, peace negotiations. Race to peace. Europa is the Nobel Prize Player of the European Parliament, and that is the thing that is very special in this league. We have the Nobel Peace Prize as European Parliament, and this makes us ever more obliged to re-establish peace. And action beinhaltet immer Reaktion. Action always leads to reaction. And when we use strong weapons to Ukraine, that they are being used. And if we Send heavy weapons to Ukraine that are used in Ukraine. There is not no more no blood, death, and death. Ever more people will die and suffer. That's right. Yeah. Blood, death, and death. Okay. And it's got. So there's got to be a reaction that the other side has to be much more weapons and heavier. And the other side will use ever stronger and ever heavier and more weapons as well. Let's say it's here the irregular auffassung in Europa, that the Europa, the EU, insgesamt with the NATO, 420 million jährlich an Rüstungsgüter oder für die Rüstung ausgibt. And then, well, there is this wrong belief in Europe that NATO was would spend 420 billion euro for equipment yearly. Und im Gegensatz dazu Russland 60 Milliarden. And Russia would spend 60 billion. Und das verführt hier jetzt viele Abgeordnete dazu zu glauben, man könne diesen Krieg gewinnen. And thus many European parliamentarians. Do believe they could win this war based on this erroneous thinking? And I can tell you, I say this war is not to be won. There is no winner. And I can tell you, I say this: nobody can win this war. We will all lose out. And I think that yeah, we must quickly end this war. So yes, we absolutely have to make sure that this war comes on. Comes to an end immediately. And I should be for Delany to hold up the tension. So yes, Mrs. Delany, I agree. I entirely agree with what you said. And so long as we have this situation, we have, we see it now in the Ukraine. And I don't mean really not from the Copenhagen criteria, but I mean just from the current situation. And as long as the situation in Ukraine. Is like it is, and I'm not talking about the Copenhagen criteria. Just about the situation. As long as the situation in Ukraine is like it is, is he the committee chair in this matter? Any kind of membership, well, it's unthinkable. It's absolutely not possible. Und das war es auch. Insofern greift diese Drohung auch gar nicht mit dem Beitrittsland Ukraine jetzt den den Status Beitrittsland. Das greift gegenüber Russland nicht, weil Russland Sagt direkt Putin, der ist ja nicht dümmer als wir, der weiß das auch. Well, and um, Putin um, is as intelligent uh, as uh, ourselves, so, so he is very well aware of the situation and he very well knows that uh, this official candidate status will not lead to um, membership pretty soon. Also, ich mache es kurz, ich will nur noch abschließend sagen, wir. Sehen, also ich sehe es so aus meiner vorherigen Aufgabe als Politiker und dafür mache ich mich auch stark in der Delegation in unserer Fraktion. Well, so to come to a summary and to be brief in my role as a politician and that's what I defend towards my colleagues. Dass wir nicht über den Krieg reden, sondern dass wir über den Frieden reden. I say, everybody, let's don't talk about the war, but talk about 
Peace. Und es gibt Mittel und Wege, und die sind auch bekannt, wie wir das befrieden können. And there are ways to peace, and everybody is aware about how we can come to peace. Den Personal von mächtigen Leuten ist leider total eine andere. Unfortunately, many powerful people do think differently for the moment. So muss man so deutlich sagen, they have different interests to be clear. And I do dare to say so. Und deswegen ist es, sind wir alle umso mehr gefordert, auch Sie, gerade solche Veranstaltungen wie heute durchzuführen. And that's why we all um, are obliged to have uh, meetings uh, um, like uh, the one today. We all have to make sure that we um, yeah, have those kind of meetings. Und wenn wir schon mal Pressefreiheit sind, and if it's about freedom of the press, dann kann ich nur anmerken, Dann muss es auch unsere aller Aufgabe sein, dafür zu stehen und zu arbeiten, dass solche Veranstaltungen wie heute auch in die Presse kommen. Dann ist es wahr, wie Sie bereits gesagt haben. Es ist unsere Aufgabe, unsere Aufgabe, zu machen, dass diese Art von Konferenz die Außenwelt der Außenwelt erreicht, dass es publiziert wird in den Medien. Wenn ich beobachten kann, und seit Februar, dass alles, also auch schon vor Februar, aber dass alles, was wir, wir, die Abgeordneten, die für Frieden eintreten, gegen den Krieg sind, in die Presse fernhalten wird. Ja, I can see that all um, colleagues uh, of mine and myself that do want peace, I want to talk about peace, no longer appear in the media. Since February, in particular since February, but already before. Nobody talks about us in the media. Und ich frage mich wirklich, ob das Pressefreiheit ist, wenn Sie uh, jeden Abend die Nachrichten schauen, Und dort nur eins hören, Krieg und Waffen liefern und wir müssen alle zusammenstehen und die Gürtel enger schnallen und uns äh, auf Energiekrise einschwören. Mm -hmm. And I would like to ask you, is this freedom of press, if you open the um, television at night for, uh, to watch the news and all you hear is war and we've got to deliver more and more heavy equipment uh, and uh, we all have to uh, save economy and uh, make sure uh, we can uh, survive this way. If you hear only this in the media, war, 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 is this freedom of press? Die Presse berichtet in keinster Weise, dass mittlerweile es immer mehr werden hier im Europäischen Parlament, die das völlig anders sehen. <coughs> and press does not reflect at all that ever more members of, of European Parliament and do see it differently, definitely differently, and would like to have peace. Das wollte ich zu Ihren Beiträgen anmerken, und uh, ich danke für Ihre Beiträge, denn das ist völlig konform mit den Ansicht vieler Abgeordneter, hier, die aber kein Gehör kriegen. Mm -hmm. So once more, thank you for your statements, and I can tell you, many members of Parliament do think the same, even if they are uh, not listen to and don't uh, give uh, a, uh, are not given a media platform. Thank you. Thank you. Interesting. Thank you, Mr. Gulking, for actively sharing your thoughts, and thank you, uh, Mrs. Uh, Linderman, for your assistance. Now we would like to have uh, Mr. Uh, de Bullet. Mr. De Bullet, if you could um, uh, share your thoughts about what has been said previously. Uh, Mr. De Bullet, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. I hope you see me well and you hear well. Um, if that is the case, uh, then I'm pleased to, uh, to be with you and participate in this discussion. Um, I, I thank you for inviting the concept here. And I would like to give um, some conceptual perspective to the discussion and basically submit uh, three main comments. First, would be to to confirm this obvious is that the Ukraine's attention for the EU is an internal matter for the EU with Ukraine, in which the Council of Europe, of course, has no say. Uh, the Council of Europe is contributing to the process, um, discussing with the EU, helping Ukraine in reaching the Copenhagen criteria, but in no way is the concept of part of the EU, of the Ukraine's accession to the uh, EU. Uh, therefore, I've been 
very pleased to, to hear all the comments by previous speakers, and I, I took, of course, good notes. Uh, my second comment from all consider your perspective is that Ukraine is, of course, already part of the European family. Ukraine joined the country of Europe in 95 already. Since then, Ukraine is a full member of the country of Europe, of this human rights body seated in Strasbourg, and is one of the 46 European countries discussing, debating every day on rule of law, human rights, and democracy issues. When Ukraine joined the Council of Europe, it committed to accede to a series of um, human rights, rule of law, democracy values, mostly in European conventions. Actually, today, Ukraine is a signatory and a party, a full party, to 95 European conventions um, touching upon rule of law, human rights issues. So, Ukraine already is committed to reach all these values, which are also the same values um, uh, touched upon by the uh, EU's Copenhagen criteria. Of course, it doesn't mean, and, and, and we know that Ukraine has reached all these uh, benchmarks, but Ukraine in the Council of Europe and with the Council of Europe is on a daily basis since its accession and actually already before, meaning in 95, working on it with the Council of Europe. Um, for instance, among the conventions ratified by Ukraine, we have, of course, all the, namely and firstly, the Human Rights Convention, Convention on Human Rights, which is protected by the court, the Human Rights Court in Strasbourg. But then you also find all conventions dealing with corruption issues, money laundering, anti-terrorism, cybercrime issue, protection of minorities, uh, protection of women against violence, the Istanbul Convention that Ukraine very recently ratified, the Lanzarote Convention on protecting children against abuse, and many others. Most of these conventions are followed, monitored by monitoring bodies. These are objective, independent, impartial bodies who, which go to the country, visit the country, uh, observe the situation, and then report and then recommend the country to do progress. This is uh, active evaluation done by in the expert that is then published. Why I underline this, that these monitoring bodies give substantial elements for an evaluation by others. Of course, in this discussion, others mean mostly the EU. So when the EU is observing, assessing the situation of the rule of law, the human rights and democracy in countries such as Ukraine, but such as many others, it mostly refers to the Council of but among others, it refers to the Council of Europe findings. If you look at the Commission opinion granting the candidate status to Ukraine, you will, you will find in the Commission's opinion dozens of references to these Council of Europe bodies and findings. The Venice Commission, for instance, the Greco, which is our monitoring against corruption, Monival, which is the body on money laundering and tourism financing, and members. This is the case for Ukraine, as it is the case actually for any other country. Um, and that's the way in which the EU cooperates with the country of Europe on the enlargement process at large. This is something that we have experienced for years for the Western Balkans in their accession process to the EU. And actually, it's also true, by the way, on um, the way the Commission assesses the flow situation in its own mandate, which is also important. Uh, for instance, and Now, what I would like to stress again is that 
This evaluation done by monitoring bodies is an expert and professional evaluation. The conclusions to be derived from these monitoring bodies' conclusions and recommendations, these political conclusions are, of course, taken by the political bodies, which are EU institutions, not, of course, by the Council of Europe. My third comment is uh, simply to inform about the Council of Europe's reaction on the war in Ukraine. First, the Committee of Ministers, the deciding body of the Council of Europe, decided that Russia ceased to be a member of the organization as of as from 16th of March this year and ceased to be a party to the European Convention of Human Rights as from 16th of September this year. Second, on Ukraine, after visits in Ukraine and discussions in Ukraine, including by Secretary General early May, um, we have adapted our plan of action, a plan of cooperation with Ukraine, to, ask, to assist Ukraine in their priority request. For the moment, this priority request is mostly helping the, um, the judiciary in Ukraine to properly investigate war crimes and massive human rights violations. Um, for obvious reasons, our monitoring bodies for the moment cannot access the territory of the territory of Ukraine, obviously. That being said, end of June, the Secretary General issued a report on the human rights situation in Crimea. As such, I will send the uh, link to the organizers of the, of the webinar uh, who will distribute it. And similarly, also, the Human Rights Commissioner of the Council of Europe issued a report a few weeks ago on the human rights consequences or the human rights violations linked to the war in Ukraine, which is also quite interesting. Um, so, uh, for the rest, the, 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 our plan of action, uh, which has been adapted to the new reality in Ukraine, has been endorsed by the Committee of Ministers and is ready to be uh, implemented now in Ukraine as soon as the situation permits, of course. And in that context, to come back to the uh, discussion today, of course, the cooperation, the relation with the EU and with the Commission in particular will be ever closer. Also, in view of the Commission's financial support for the Council of Europe's support in Ukraine to help countries to proceed within these, um, these obligations deriving from the Copenhagen criteria. So I hope I've not been too long and thank you again for giving me the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Debulet, for elaborating your opinion. I will now open the Q&A uh, session addressed to all members of the webinar. So if you desire to uh, ask question or add a comment or react to what has been said previously, thanks for uh, identifying yourself. Um, um, we have a comment in the chat box uh, from Mr. Alexander uh, Rar. Uh, please, Mr. Rar, if you could please present yourself and share your comment. Uh, yes, uh, dear colleague, thank you for inviting me. I hope uh, you can uh, see me and hear me. We can hear you, but we cannot see you. No. Now? Now you can. Sorry, the connections are not <laughs> very well. Um, I have only a very short comment, um, mainly a question. I worked for over 10 years uh, very closely with the organization of Yalta European Strategy. Probably it's an organization, an Ukrainian organization, international organization, which is very known in Brussels. And uh, I must say, yes, we had a lot of progress, even 10, 15 years ago, on uh, bringing Ukraine closer to the European Union. Uh, I can confirm this. Uh, but the problems uh, remain, and they were uh, also stressed here at our web seminar. 
they're quite serious. So there's a lot of obstacles to go, but I think uh, at the end there is uh, a light at the tunnel. Second, what I wanted to say, and this is my question, what are we going to do um, with um, other countries like Moldova and Georgia who think from their point of view that they also have uh, established firm associational ties with the European Union and they deserve the same kind of treatment as Kiev, as Ukraine. Yes, they are not in war with Russia, but this is not the argument for now taking Ukraine into the European Union, I think. So, uh, and the Western Balkans countries uh, who uh, really fought for uh, for years uh, for readmission into the European Union, will they will be um, left uh, alone for, for, for many more years? Because the European Union would have to concentrate fully on um, taking Ukraine as as member, one of the hugest com countries in, in Europe. Uh, this is my question mark. And, and, and then what are we going to establish our relations with the Eurasian countries? I don't mean Russia. We are still making the, uh, the, the mistake, in my point of view, that we are regarding or trying to regard the European, uh, the Eurasian Union solely as uh, part of as, 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 as the Russian Empire, as something what uh, Russia needs in order to boost itself uh, as an empire again. It's uh, not the case, because we see that uh, the Central Asian countries, three of them are very closely linked, uh, or members of the Eurasian uh, Economic Union, uh, are also trying to... Um, connect themselves with the European Union, but also with uh, Russia, with China, with India, with countries of the region. So um, my player would be, of course, I understand this is a very difficult to talk about now in the in the situation where we have a war between uh, Ukraine and Russia. Still, still, I want to revive uh, the idea of uh, a broader, a wider Europe. Uh, Europe from Lisbon to Vladivostok, not not in the sense as we have done it maybe romantically and peacefully the years before, but on the other hand, this idea is not gone because again we we are facing uh, a lot of countries in that region. Uh, I'm talking about Central Asians who have, by the way, also an in initiative and uh, with the European Union, the EU initiative on Central Asia is still existing. I think they have. In three of such initiatives, they are more or less working. But uh, also countries like uh, Armenia, like Azerbaijan, who are badly needed, Azerbaijan is badly needed, as I understand, for the European Union for uh, energy cooperation. So please um, think about that. How, how are we going? This is a strategic choice for us to establish also contacts with these countries, with Russia, with bringing Russia one day closer also to this kind of cooperation or not. This is uh, also a, a question which has to be discussed. But please think wider. Uh, in my in my view, as we do it now. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Rar, uh, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, now see, I see that uh, Mr. Metan has his uh, hands raised. So please, you have the floor. Mr. Metan, I'm sorry, but you are still unmuted. We cannot hear you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. No, I, I shared uh, I share what uh, Mr. Wa has said. I think it's important to 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 keep a broader view of the things. I just wanted to also uh, I appreciate uh, a lot the comments of uh, our colleagues today, but I just wanted to make a point about the values because, as it has been mentioned. We speak about corruption, justice, and human rights, minorities, which is quite uh, good. But I just wanted to remember that the European Union was founded to make peace. The core value of the European Union was peace, to forbid civil war inside Europe. Uh, that was, it was the goal in the 50s of the European founders. And I think this core goal has been forgotten now. It was forgotten uh, first time uh, during the Yugoslavian war and the bombing of Serbia in 99, but it, it's, it's also forgotten now with Ukraine because uh, arming, arming and arming Ukraine until the last Ukrainian dead, dead I think that's not really a peaceful goal. And 
I think the European, the Europe's and European Union now should rediscover its core value of peace. It's for me a kind of scandal, if I can say, that no one in Europe is trying to make peace, to propose peace. It's not, uh, there is not only a person, Mr. Macron or so, so anyway, but nobody is proposing a peace uh, method to end this war. It's incredible if you look at the history of the European Union. The, the only guy who is uh, trying to make peace, who is acting as a peace broker, is Mr. Erdogan in Turkey. But I think it's completely, for me as a Swiss, even for the Swiss, I am very critical with the Swiss government because they, they, they make the Swiss neutrality collapsing uh, and they are no more able to, to be, Switzerland is no more able to be a peace broker, which is the Swiss tradition. But for me, it's terrible, you know, uh, and it's a basic contradiction for European Union and European people now, this incapacity to be a peace broker. And a second remark, and after I stop, is also the loss of centrality for Europe. Because we are concentrated, that's our goal, uh, on European issues, and that's very important for sure. But we are also losing the capacity of, uh, uh, of being or to, be, to keep uh, as a, a, central, a central power or a central power is not may, maybe not the good word, but our central capacity uh, to influence the world. Because what was the, also the capacity of Europe these last decades was also to set values. To, 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 to have the capacity to be the, the setter of values, uh, uh, cooperation, human rights, also, also Americans do it, did it, but they had an agenda. Europe has not more now. We can say the kind of imperial agenda, which is not the case of Europe. So we were credible as European in the world, I mean, in the broad world, uh, with this capacity of setting values like uh, anti-corruption and so on. But now we are losing this capacity because we are, uh, we are installing, we are managing a war inside Europe and nobody is taking the political risk to broke the peace, which is for me a terrible message we send to the, the rest of the world. And it's not astonishing in these conditions that the broader world, the Ch China, India to Africa, Latin America, does not sustain the West in uh, the Ukrainian war now. Because all the, 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 the broader world is reluctant to take side, reluctant to sustain and to support a collective Western Europe and America against Russia uh, because of that. And I think we should also keep in mind this aspect of the problem and to rediscover our core value, which is not only independence of justice, but peace. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, much, much, yes. Meton. Thank you very much, Mr. Meton, for adding and elaborating your opinion. Um, I see Mr. Francesco is raising his hand. Mr. Francesco, please present yourself and share your thoughts. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hope you are hearing from me. Uh, this is Francesco Peritera speaking. I'm a scholar in uh, East European Studies at the University of Bologna, and I'm very grateful for, for, for uh, to, to Vocal Europe for, for, for this invitation. Thanks also to Ali, who was a former student of mine. And uh, thanks for, for sharing ideas during, during the webinar. Um, I, I agree the most uh, with, with, with you. And I would like just to uh, sketch some points about, uh, since uh, the, 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 the lack of time, I will, be, uh, I, I will be, how to say, quite, quite brief, uh, point by point. But first of all, I would like to say that 
uh, it, it is not foreseeable any any integration of Ukraine into EU uh, if not solving at first uh, the issue uh, of uh, what the Western Balkans integration into the EU. And this is not only because the lasting time that those countries spent in waiting be uh, of becoming members of the Union, uh, but this is because the, the, the dissolution of Yugoslavia is at the origins of many of the problems that Ukraine is facing nowadays, especially since the way we have approached and managed the issue of self-determination as an outcome of the Yugoslav dissolution. And uh, if we are not able to find positive solutions for the Western Balkans, uh, the Bosnian issue, the Albanian issue, meaning the Kosovo, Albania, North Macedonia, uh, the, the Serbian Kosovo, Kosovo relationships, it will be impossible to find any, uh, uh, how to say, realistic solution to, a Ukrainian, uh, to the Ukrainian affairs. Uh, and we, if we are not able to do that in a, in a, in a short of time, this will create a, a, a lot of troubles to the EU uh, itself, of course, uh, but also, uh, how to say, will affect sincere, uh, significantly also, also relationship with Russia for the future, uh, as far as it is the possibility to find uh, a compromise on on uh, the Ukrainian uh, on uh, the Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian affair. Um, the um, finding solution for the Western Balkans will offer also room for solutions for other issues open in Europe, like uh, the Catalonian case, uh, the Scottish case, and so on and so forth. So it is a paramount importance, in my view, at first to find the way to give an end to the long-lasting Western Balkans issue uh, in the European political agendas. Uh, secondly, the second point is about uh, how to say um, uh, the uh, Ukrainian issue per se, and, and this is uh, I, I, I perfectly agree with uh, Miss Delaney uh, when she say that uh, uh, that uh, we cannot avoid geography. Uh, we have to deal with Russia. Uh, historically, Western countries uh, had a very bipolar relationship with Russia itself. Uh, we were foes, we were allies. It depends on uh, how to say the, the uh, historical contingencies, but in fact, we cannot avoid geography. And in the end, we have to find a way to stay, uh, how to say, uh, close to uh, each other, taking in consideration, first of all, that uh, global warming is changing in, uh, significantly the, the geopolitical environment for the future. Russia will be a crucial country for the next half of the century, as well as, as because uh, the, the global warming will transform completely in, uh, the Russian environment in the future. Siberia will be one of the most prosperous regions in the world in the second half of the centuries due to the detrusting of, uh, of, the, uh, of the area. Uh, which will offer enormous opportunities for Russia, not only in terms of commodities, but also transforming this area into one of the most fertile areas in, 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 in the world. Uh, the, the, the icing of the Arctic seas will offer Russia in less than 10 years the opportunity to have a, a, an access to the seas out of the control of uh, uh, how to say uh, the, 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 the Western countries in many respects. And this is one of the reasons why Sweden and Finland are uh, keen to join NATO as soon as possible. Uh, then um, uh, the, the ca resilience capacity of, of Russia has been, in my view, underestimated. Uh, historically, Russia has a very strong resilience capacity, uh, stronger than many Western countries have uh, traditionally. And for the European, Western European countries, especially, this is a very difficult time, is a very difficult time, as uh, we uh, don't know exactly in which kind of conditions Western Europeans will be at the end of, uh, how to say, the, not only this year, but how to say in less than one year. After winter in which uh, uh, European societies will be very stressed by, 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 um, uh, 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 by, by 
um, uh, energy supply, uh, shortage of energy supplies by by the increasing of uh, living costs, by by the increasing of inflation and so on and so forth. About the stability of Western governments, I will ha will have some doubts. Uh, countries, relevant countries like Italy, for example, will be probably under elections in between winter time, spring time. So, and uh, the the political forecast are, are in favor of uh, giving the 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 the, the, the um, political. Uh, winning to rightist movements, rightist parties in Italy, many of them very close to Russian uh, perspectives. Uh, and this will uh, uh, affect sig significantly, how to say, in, in, in such a case, how to say, the, 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 the stability of Europe. Traditionally, Italy is, how to say, the most delicate country among the Western countries. Uh, since uh, the stability of the country is strictly connected to the stability of the international environment. The more the international environment is going to be destabilized, the more Italy is going to be destabilized itself and is moving into a significant political crisis, which may occur into, how to say, uh, uh, authoritarian, para-authoritarian regimes, anyhow, affecting significantly the, the stability, the political stability. So which kind of political stability will face Europe next springtime? I don't know exactly, since uh, the resilience capacity of Western European countries is, in my view, less efficient than the Russian one. So uh, we have to take in consideration exactly as Ms. Delaney said before, that we have not to find short range, um, how to say, solutions, but we have to think in long lasting uh, uh, solutions, okay? And, and uh, the, the, first we is, uh, the first step is in fact, in my view, in the hands of the European Union and Western European countries. It is by, us that we have to find a way uh, to offer solutions to the Ukrainian crisis. We have not to wait and see uh, or to try or, or, or to think that postponing or, or giving the chance to Ukraine to resist the longest uh, would give us, uh, how to say, a, a better opportunity. Uh, the longer the war will, will last, uh, how to say, in my view, uh, the, 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 incre in, the, the problems for Western Europeans will increase and the stabilizations will be much more, how to say, reliable for us than for Russia. Uh, so it is up to us to offer as soon as possible solutions for the Ukrainian crisis. And we can start to do that if we will be able to find solutions for the Western Balkans and, and uh, as, as a model uh, that could be then offered to Ukraine and to Russia for the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pergitera. Uh, now, um, I I would I wanted to actually ask if someone would have a brief response to what I've been said, but really brief because we have just three minutes before the conclusion. Mr. Krivansky, this floor is yours. Just very shortly. Well, uh, I'm very glad to hear there is a problem uh, related to the minority issues in uh, in Ukraine in the Western Balkans, and and there is one thing we forget. There is an instrument. The minority safe pack, which is supported by the European Parliament, but is completely blocked by the European uh, Commission. So if we don't change this point of view of the Commission to give an instrument to, to resolve uh, uh, minority issues, it, it, it will be a hard way uh, in, for the next uh, years. Uh, because we saw, the, uh, as was mentioned, the Catalan problem. We saw how it was uh, resolved. They are joining people for their opinion only, and uh, Europe did, did not uh, act as uh, should. So, in it happened in silence. So, please uh, take in consideration there are an instrument uh, already voted by 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 the and supported by the European Parliament, the Minority Safe Pack. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Krivansky. Uh, now, since we are getting close to the conclusion, I would like to um, address a warm thank you all uh, for being here today and for this lively discussion and uh, for your precious contribution to the topic. Uh, I will now give the floor to Mr. Molos for some concluding remarks, and uh, we will then end our discussion for today. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. I think it was a very lively uh, debate and very open, open mind. Uh, <coughs> I'm particularly <coughs> concerned by the last remark of Mr. Vivansky, uh, because I'm speaking to you from uh, my home place, which is Corsica. And as you know, uh, we have, uh, in France, we don't have any minority rights. Minority don't exist. But uh, in fact, the reality is different. The freedom in Corsica, the Corsican people are not a minority, they, are, they represent the majority of the people. Uh, and uh, France will open in one week discussion with the local, local, local government uh, to give autonomy to, to Corsica. I don't know yet how far they will go. But we see things are moving, so this, this topic of, uh, of minority rights is very important. And as, as also, I, I, I thank all the participants, and thanks to those who mentioned the question of Western Balkans. This is, uh, this is a key issue, uh, and we should always have an eye, because we know that the situation is, uh, is very tense. I would just say, as a, as a as conclusive work, uh, word, that, uh, as I say, I'm, I'm, I was personally engaged in that, uh, uh, but uh, to, to to grant this uh, statute of candidate con country to, to Ukraine, uh, because I think it's important to, in that time to remember that we all belong to the European family. And, and to be honest, it's a kind of, and I like uh, echo what uh, Ms. Delaney and some others says, it's a, it's a way to, to give an alternative to the NATO. The European Union, as it was mentioned, is, is not the NATO. So some participants are members of countries like, like Ireland, which is also Austria, and some others who don't belong, uh, Malta, Cyprus, and others who don't belong uh, for the moment, or don't belong, I think, for, for the NATO. And it's very important what uh, Mr. Metan also mentioned, it's to come back to the roots of, uh, of the European Union. Mr. Goiking presented the, well, uh, them. Uh, very, very well, and these roots defined by the Council of Europe, uh, and uh, very thankful to Mr. De Bure to have uh, mentioned all the rules and all the, the framework of, uh, of the Council of Europe. It's a pity that the fourth Russia is, is, now, is now out. Of course, it's their responsibility, but it's a pity because it was really a way for uh, uh, giving some, some guidelines, at least for, for, for the Russian people, not speaking about the Russian government, but Russian, Russian people. So it's important to focus on what uh, are the European values and the specificity of the European Union in that regard. Uh, it's not, uh, they don't have an imperialistic uh, agenda. They not, don't want to rule the world. They want to, not to be a model, but to give some example. It's a good example of peacekeeping to other parts of the world. And of course, uh, the day we, lose that, we are losing a lot of the specificity of the uh, specificity of the uh, European project. I thank also Mr. Malmandier for this for his uh, for his intervention and very concrete case. This shows that uh, there is uh, still a lot to do. And I think the, the, the situation of Mr. Medvedchuk and other in other opponent, even Mr. Mr. Poroshenko is also is uh, I think he escaped to to, to England and other we have a former president, is also, is also in trouble. I think uh, it's important to, to recall the European principle uh, of respect, of independence, of justice, and should not be used political reasons to use them uh, in, the, in, the, in the judiciary. So this is, this is very important. And I think this uh, candidate status uh, is, uh, of course, a gift to the to Ukrainian, Ukrainian people. But this keeps is linked with rights, obligation, rights, but also obligation, obligation to follow this guideline. But it's important that the European Union itself respects that guideline. 
So having said that, I thank uh, all of you very warmly for this, uh, I think, unique, first very open debate on the situation of uh, Ukraine as a, as a candidate country. Uh, this uh, session has been registered. It will be uh, put on the website of Vocab Europe and sent to all European institutions and journalists. And of course, at your disposal, I will personally thank very much uh, all, the, all the speakers. Uh, thank very much, uh, Mr. 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 Goyking, for his political uh, weight. He put his political weight in the debate. He put his, uh, his, own, his own charisma uh, as a member of parliament, as a member close to the to the European values, uh, European values of family, European values uh, of, uh, of trust. And, and I recognize myself, I'm, I'm, I'm also a Christian Democrat, so I recognize with him the Christ, Christian democratic, uh, democratic values. Uh, and I thank, of course, uh, our two uh, young participants, uh, researcher uh, Daniel and Ali and uh, Nadi Hart. Uh, teacher was there too, a professor. And I thank them all for their very engaged, very engaged work. And I think it's, it's the honor of Vocal Europe to put on the scene uh, young talent, young people with, with a great future. Thank you very much and have a, have a good day and uh, have a good lunch. Bye bye. Au revoir, merci, ciao, arrivederci, au revoir. Thank you all. Bye bye. Hmm. Thank you very much. Thank Goodbye. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.